I grew up in a family that loved the outdoors. From a young age, my brothers and I were encouraged to be strong, brave, and ready for anything nature could throw at us. This passion for the outdoors led me to become a park ranger, and by the time I was in my late 20s, I was working at gates of the Arctic National Park in Alaska. I had a strong desire to test my limits and face difficult conditions. I also dreamed of becoming a climbing ranger, so I started a tough training program. One time I decided to go on a solo trip into the mountains. The temperature was around 15 degrees, and a heavy storm was rolling in. The wind was blowing at 35 miles per hour, and a whiteout was starting to make everything look the same. As the day went on, it got late, and the visibility became very poor. I felt quite sure that no one else would be on the mountain in such rough weather, but that kind of adventure excited me. I dreamed of leading climbing expeditions one day and was determined to prepare myself. I wasn't completely familiar with the entire region because a lot of it was new to me. I had looked at the map and found a good campsite on a mountain pass. The terrain there was flatter, and a few ridges would help protect me from avalanches. As I made my way up, I focused on my GPS to find my path. When I reached one of the ridges, I knew I was getting close to my chosen campsite. I looked down into the sheltered area between the ridges and felt a sense of accomplishment. Suddenly, I heard a loud, strange bellowing sound. It was so unexpected that I stopped in my tracks. My mind raced, trying to understand what it could be, and I knew it wasn't a human. Could it be a reindeer? Did it sound like a reindeer? The sound was unlike anything I had heard before in the wilderness. There weren't many animals around in those harsh conditions, but I remembered that I wasn't far from an area where muskoxen tended to roam. I hoped it wasn't a muskox because they can charge at people if they feel threatened. I estimated the sound was 20, 30 yards away. The strong winds blew around the pass from different directions, making it hard to tell where the sound had come from. I tried to look in every direction, but it was difficult to see anything clearly. Then I heard the sound again. This time it was a strange, mournful howl. It was unlike anything I had heard before. I knew it definitely wasn't a reindeer. I couldn't shake the feeling that it sounded otherworldly. Despite this, the rational part of my mind kept insisting it was probably a muskox, which seemed like the most likely explanation. This time, I knew exactly where the sound was coming from. It was right in the sheltered area between the ridges, while I was still standing on top of one of them. I felt very exposed and nervous. If a muskox charged at me, I wouldn't be able to outrun it, and there was nowhere for me to hide. I thought about quickly moving in the opposite direction of the sound, but then I decided that if I could set up my tent, I might be safe inside it. I moved away from the area where I heard the bellowing, but I kept looking around and behind me, feeling very anxious. Eventually, I found a flat spot where the wind was calmer. I walked around the spot for a few seconds, checking to make sure it was big enough for my tent. It seemed like the right size, so I started to set up my tent there. I threw off my backpack and gear and turned to look where I had heard the sound. Through the snowdrift, I couldn't be sure what I was seeing. I noticed a large shadow, but it was faint. I couldn't tell if it was moving or if the snow and wind were playing tricks on my eyes. I stared into the snowdrift for about 20 seconds, trying to figure out if there was a huge animal watching me or not. The uncertainty made me feel uneasy. I decided the best thing to do was to set up my tent quickly. Inside, I would be hidden from view and hopefully safe. As I worked, I kept glancing back toward the shadow to see if it had disappeared, but every time I looked it was still there. It was very confusing and made me feel anxious. My mind kept going in circles, wondering, could it be a muskox, could it be a rock? With my heart racing, I focused on getting my tent up as fast as possible, hoping that being inside would give me some protection and peace of mind. As soon as the tent was up, I quickly moved my gear inside, closed the tent, and felt a bit more sheltered. However, the wind was making strange and loud noises against the tent cloth, which made it hard to relax. Every sound seemed to echo, and it was difficult to tell if it was the wind or something else outside. I kept thinking I heard heavy footsteps or the sound of a large animal breathing close to the tent. It was hard to be sure with the tent flapping so much. 
I got into my sleeping bag and placed my shovel and ice axe right next to me, just in case I needed them. Suddenly, I heard a high-pitched cry. It sounded like a scream and I couldn't ignore it. I had to look outside. When I did, I saw something that made me freeze in fear. It was huge and upright, probably about eight feet tall. It was powerfully built and covered in shaggy dark hair. Its head looked like an ape's with a very pronounced brow. The creature looked up at the sky and screamed again. My heart was beating so fast and I was filled with fear. All I could think of was Bigfoot. In a panic, I curled into a ball in my sleeping bag and covered my head with my arms. I felt helpless and stayed like that all night long, too scared to move. When daylight finally came, I looked out and heard only silence. The creature was gone, but I felt very shaky as I made my way back down the mountain. That encounter definitely affected my confidence. However, I persevered and continued working as a park ranger. Nowadays, I work at a national park in California. I need a little more time before I venture into such remote areas again. A year ago, something strange happened on my farm, and it all began with one of my favorite goats. One night, I found it dead. I thought a wild animal, like a coyote, had attacked it. As a new farmer, my fences were not strong enough, so I believed a predator had come during the night, killed my goat, and then ran away when something scared it off. That's why I thought there was no blood. I was very sad and felt guilty, so I didn't pay much attention to the strange details. Later, I realized I had made a mistake. Maybe if I had noticed sooner, things would have been different, but I didn't, and soon I had a big problem. The first goat that died was older, so I thought it might have just died naturally. I found it at the edge of the pasture, and I didn't notice the two tiny holes in its neck. I'm sure they were there, but I missed them. I only discovered them after seeing what happened to the other goats. The next goat was a young buck, but this one seemed to have fought hard. There was blood everywhere, and the wound was rough and jagged. One night, while I was sitting on the porch looking at the stars, I heard loud noises coming from the pasture. By the time I got there, the goat was already dead. I saw tracks nearby that were different from anything I had seen before. These tracks had three toes and were covered in tiny scale-like patterns. They looked like they belonged to a reptile, but they were much bigger than any animal tracks I had ever studied in my college biology classes. There were no animals in the area that could leave such tracks, and I doubted that even exotic animals would have tracks like these. As I stood there looking at the strange footprints, I realized something very unusual was happening on my farm. I needed to find out what it was before more of my animals were hurt. After the second goat was killed, I decided to install an electric fence. It worked well for a while and there were no more incidents for about six months. During that time, I became less worried, thinking the danger had passed. But one hot night in August, the electric fence stopped working. I didn't realize it right away, and my goats were left unprotected from the clever creature. I had noticed strange tracks near the fence several times before. They were unlike any animal tracks I had ever seen. It seemed like the creature had been testing the fence to find a way in. Since I hadn't seen any tracks for about six weeks, I thought it had moved on to another farm. One night, while I was sitting on the porch gazing at the stars, I heard my goats making loud, distressed noises. My heart sank and I began to sweat with worry. I feared the worst. I knew the electric fence was old and unreliable, as I had bought it at an auction earlier in the year. I never thought that the creature would return, but I realized how naive I had been. I quickly grabbed my gun and ran towards the noise. The night was clear and the moon was bright. When I reached the goats, I was shocked by what I saw. Two goats were already dead, lying on the ground, and a third goat was struggling against a strange creature. The creature was like nothing I had ever seen before. It had brownish-green scales that glistened in the moonlight. Its eyes were round and dark, and its teeth were sharp. The most frightening thing about it was its two long canine teeth. These teeth had made small, deep holes in the necks of the goats. I realized that the creature was drinking the blood of the goats instead of eating their flesh. The goats' bodies were torn and jagged from trying to escape the creature's bite. As I stood there, I understood that this creature was very dangerous and clever. 
I had to find a way to protect my goats and stop it from attacking again. Along the back of the creature were spines like those of a bluegill fish. It stood about three feet tall, but it was very strong. I watched in horror as it quickly overpowered the third goat. The creature sank its sharp canines into the goat's neck and began to lap up the blood with its forked tongue, much like a dog drinking water from a bowl. Its eyes rolled back, showing only the whites, as if it took great pleasure in its meal. I was frozen in place, unable to move. Finally, a scream escaped my lips. The loud noise snapped the creature out of its trance. It turned to face me, hissing angrily. It was upset that I had interrupted its feast. Summoning all my courage, I managed to raise my gun, aiming at the strange beast. But before I could pull the trigger, it darted off into the long grass near the fence line. I stayed with the herd the rest of the night to protect them, but I was also scared for my own safety. I held the gun tightly, staying awake as much as I could, though I nodded off now and then, only to wake up and check on the goats again. When the sun finally rose, I took care of the bodies of the dead goats. Then I made some temporary repairs to the electric fence so it would work for the day. I needed to buy a new fence to protect my herd. Before heading into town, I did a quick internet search to find out what kind of creature I had encountered. I soon discovered that I was dealing with a chupacabra. According to my search, there had been many sightings of this creature throughout the southwestern United States, Mexico, and other Latin American countries. I read about other people's experiences and realized that many had gone through the same frightening events. It seemed that once the creature was spotted, it often disappeared. I hoped this would be the case for me too, but I wasn't willing to take any chances. At 22, fresh out of college with my early childhood education degree, I embarked on a quest to find a job teaching preschool. Sadly, all the public Head Start and preschool programs had filled their teacher slots. So I decided to explore private daycare centers and preschools instead. That's when I encountered Deborah. She managed a daycare center nestled in a small strip mall downtown, not far from where I lived. On the day of my interview, I couldn't help but notice the peculiar darkness enveloping the center. It lacked exterior windows, except for a clear storefront-type window facing the mall corridor. This meant that the kids played in full view of passers-by, akin to puppies in a pet store window. Stepping inside, I observed that only every other light bulb illuminated the space, casting a dim glow throughout. I couldn't help but wonder why any parent would choose such a somber environment for their children's daycare needs. It didn't exude the vibrant and cheerful atmosphere one would typically associate with a daycare center. However, the offered pay was decent, so I accepted the job, determined to make the best of the situation. One splendid autumn morning, I embarked on a new adventure with my 20 preschool students. With my yearly lesson plan meticulously prepared and fresh toys and games in hand, I was ready to make a positive impact on their lives. Our first activity? a nature walk around the park adjacent to the strip mall. As I helped the children don their jackets, Deborah emerged from her office, her expression one of surprise. Curious, she inquired about our plans. I enthusiastically explained my idea to explore the park, gather leaves, twigs, and rocks, and later discuss them as part of our morning science session. However, instead of sharing my excitement, Deborah appeared enraged. She adamantly forbade us from venturing outside unless she expressly permitted it. Furthermore, she offered to collect the natural objects herself if I needed them for our discussion. Although her reaction puzzled me, I remained steadfast in my determination to teach the children about the wonders of autumn. Accepting her offer to watch the children momentarily, I hurried outside to gather a few specimens, eager to enrich our lesson with tangible examples of seasonal change. During our discussion time, we gathered in a circle, and I showcased the treasures I had collected from our brief outdoor adventure. Holding up each item, I posed a question to the children. Did this change because of the fall? Predictably, the leaves, acorns, and pine cones elicited enthusiastic affirmations of yes from the children. However, when it came to the twigs and rocks, the consensus was a resounding no. Feeling a pang of guilt for raising their hopes about the outdoor excursion earlier, I apologized to the children. 
I explained that I was still learning the school's rules, just like them, and hoped they wouldn't be upset with me. To my relief, they reassured me that they harbored no ill feelings. Instead, they shared a perspective that surprised me. They explained that Miss Debbie is protecting us by keeping us inside. It was a sentiment that made me pause and ponder, realizing that perhaps there was more to the situation than met the eye. I found Deborah's remark about staying inside because it's dark and warm until their eyes were ready for the sun peculiar, but I didn't want to question her authority. Instead, I assured the children that while some things outdoors could be risky, we shouldn't fear the natural world. Their response puzzled me further. They insisted on staying indoors until their eyes were ready for the sun. It was an odd notion, but I simply nodded and shifted our conversation elsewhere. During nap time, as the children peacefully slept on their cots, I took the opportunity to organize my lesson plan at the front desk. Glancing at the open books left by Deborah, I couldn't help but notice something unusual. The parents of the children attending the daycare were paying double the tuition fees compared to other daycare centers. This discovery baffled me. Why would parents willingly pay such a hefty sum to leave their children in a seemingly dreary and uninspiring environment every day? Despite my confusion about Deborah's childcare practices, I chose to focus on the positive aspect, having a job in my chosen field. After all, happiness often lies in making the best of what we have, even if we don't fully comprehend the reasoning behind certain decisions. I noticed some movement in the corner of the room where one of the kids was supposed to be napping, so I went over to check on him. When I arrived, I found him sitting up in his cot, holding a cricket between his fingers. Worried that he might hurt himself, I grabbed a tissue and offered to take the cricket from him, but instead of handing it over, the boy frowned and shook his head. No, he declared. I found it, so it's mine. With that, he popped the cricket into his mouth and started to crunch on it like it was a piece of popcorn. I was completely taken aback. Four years of college hadn't prepared me for this moment. I was unsure if eating a cricket could make him sick, and I wondered if there might be some underlying psychological issue at play. Unsure of what to do, I decided to keep calm and seek advice from Deborah in her office. Turning back to the boy, I apologized, explaining that I hadn't meant to take the cricket from him forcefully. I just meant, I said, that if you didn't want it, I could take it somewhere else. The boy flashed me a grin and said, that's okay, I'm going to sleep some more now. I nodded, agreeing that more sleep sounded like a good plan and gently tucked him back into his cot. After ensuring the child was settled, I hurried to Deborah's office, eager to seek her advice about the cricket-eating incident. However, when I entered, I found her unprepared for my visit. Something caught my eye on her desk, a lens case containing brown contact lenses. Strangely, her office was lit with a black light, and when she turned to face me, I couldn't help but notice her eyes. They were a peculiar shade of yellow with slitted pupils. Without uttering a word, I dashed to the front desk, gathered my belongings, and swiftly departed, knowing I wouldn't be returning. It wasn't until later that I fully grasped the gravity of what I had witnessed that day. Deborah's reptilian appearance, coupled with the children's odd behaviors like avoiding sunlight and eating crickets, hinted at a bizarre truth. It seemed the children and Deborah were reptilian beings in disguise. Leaving behind the unsettling daycare, I found employment in retail for the remainder of the school year. Thankfully, I secured a position with the public school district the following fall, where I've been happily teaching ever since. Now, morning nature walks are a cherished part of our regular routine under the warmth of the sun's rays. A few years back when I was in high school, I'm in college now. My friends and I heard about this abandoned psychiatric hospital in a nearby city. People said it was haunted and spooky, and some even mentioned folks going nuts exploring it. My buddies and I thought, why not check it out? I mean, I didn't buy into all the stories, but it'd be cool if something eerie happened. So we gathered our gear, flashlights, cameras, backpacks, and charged phones, all set for a weekend adventure. Online, we'd seen daytime photos of the place, but we craved the nighttime experience. 
We planned to go on a Sunday when the area would likely be quieter. My pals came over and around 10 p.m. we hit the road. It took us about 45 minutes to reach Northville, then a few more to locate the hospital. Seeing it looming in the darkness sent shivers down my spine. It was massive, run down with broken and boarded up windows and overgrown surroundings. It looked straight out of a movie set. But I laughed nervously, trying to shake off the unease. Quietly we approached, keeping our flashlights low. We hadn't spotted any cops yet, but we knew they patrolled the area. We found a way in through some broken windows, which wasn't tough. My phone's light guided us while my friends aimed their flashlights cautiously. Crunching over broken tiles, we explored the dingy interior, encountering forgotten furniture and strange artifacts. Rooms were filled with old paint cans stacked to the ceiling, folded cafeteria tables, and even a dozen fridges. It was puzzling why all this stuff had been abandoned for years. Graffiti covered the walls, some threatening, some bizarrely sentimental, but it was when we saw I Love You scrawled on a wall that things took a strange turn. While snapping pictures, we swore we heard footsteps echoing down the hall. My friend Steph's eyes widened, and tension gripped the group. I tried to brush it off, but the atmosphere grew tense. Moving cautiously, we explored further, encountering eerie sights like broken glass, discarded wheelchairs, and a mysterious metal table with strange attachments. The tension escalated when we heard more footsteps and even whistling. I checked the hallway, finding nothing, but when we gathered around Rob's camera, we saw a shadowy figure moving on the screen, though nothing was visible in the flashlight beam. That was enough for my friends. They bolted, and I followed suit as crashes and bangs echoed behind us. Finally bursting outside, we were disoriented but relieved. We still have the footage, sparking varied reactions from those we share our tale with. Some are spooked, others skeptical, but none of us are eager for a repeat. One early morning I went for meditation out in the Red Rock formations of Sedona, Arizona. The sun was rising casting beautiful red-orange light and long shadows on the timeless landscape. Sedona's beauty isn't just what you see with your eyes, there's a special energy you can almost feel with your hands. It's almost like magic. People say there are special energy spots in the area that you can feel, and I was always curious about them. Being someone who feels things deeply, this place felt like a dream come true for me. I found a spot in the middle of these amazing rock formations, hoping to find peace and connect with something bigger than myself. I settled on top of a rock that gave me a wonderful view of the sunrise. As I meditated, I felt a strong connection to the energy of the place. The morning sounds of desert birds mixed with the smell of sagebrush. It felt like I was sinking into a deep, peaceful state where the world around me faded away. That's when something unusual happened. At first I thought my imagination was playing tricks on me. The air seemed to ripple as if moved by an invisible hand. It began with a soft hum, almost drowned out by the breeze and the whispering desert grass. It felt like a gentle vibration from the ground beneath me, calming yet strange. The earthy smell I noticed earlier grew stronger. It wasn't bad, just more noticeable. It smelled like rotting leaves, damp earth, and a hint of something like sulfur, as if I were near a geyser. It felt ancient, like the rocks around me. Suddenly I felt them, these unseen presences. I call them entities because I don't know what else to call them. I couldn't see them clearly, but I could sense them moving like shadows at the edge of my vision. They didn't seem threatening, just different. It felt like they were as curious about me as I was about them. Even though I was alone, a small part of me felt uneasy. The entities had a quiet presence that was almost comforting, like they wanted to share the space with me. I tried to stay focused on my meditation, but the air felt charged with a strange tension. It seemed like time had stopped, and even the desert sounds grew quiet as if waiting for something. I tried to find my inner calm again, feeling the peace returning, and with it a sense of anticipation. Suddenly a soft touch like a feather brushed my hand. It made me shudder because it was unexpected. As I opened my eyes, the light around me seemed brighter and more alive. When I tried to look at the entities, they stayed just out of my direct sight, but they were there. 
They had a slender but solid form, like how a child might draw a stick figure, tall and thin. Their heads were unusually large, and they didn't have faces with regular features like noses or mouths. Where you'd expect eyes, there were just two dark spots, deep and intense. Just as I was getting used to their presence, the humming grew louder and more powerful. The vibration seemed to match the rhythm of my heartbeat. There was no spoken language, but I felt a kind of communication, a sharing of energy. It didn't feel like they were angry or happy, just open. I can't say I wasn't scared because I was, but my fear slowly turned into curiosity. I felt like the entities were there to observe, maybe learn something. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, they began to fade away. When I finally got up, I felt different, as if the encounter had changed me. I knew I would never be the same again.